welcome to Behind the Story, where we learn the story behind your favourite stories. My name is Lisa Renee. I'm from the Collaborative Press, where we help authors self-publish, and I'm also a romance author of the Single Again series. And I'm Naomi Craig, author of historical fiction, Rahab's Courage. Last show, we had a great time with Karen Beery and she had offered a draw for avoiding marriage. So be sure to check in the show notes and congratulations to our winner. Lisa, what are you working on this week? Okay, well, I've got a week left to do my final edits for No Filter and it's off to you, Naomi. You're going to fix it and make it awesome for me. <laughs> I'll be sending it to my critique partners, Naomi and a few others, and then also my editor. And then, uh, then it will be off to the um, beta readers and ready for the launch in June. So busy, busy. What about you, Naomi? Um, I am just finishing up my pre-buy prequel exclusively for pre-buy. Um, and then I'll have that off to an editor soon. So always something going on for sure <laughs> that's excellent okay well our guest today is a biblical author as well Naomi so this is going to be great for you KD Holmberg KD is a retired flight attendant who turned an empty nest into a workshop for creating stories around remarkable women she and her husband Keith live in South Carolina and love to travel and golf they have five children and eight extraordinary grandchildren. She welcomes new friends at kdholmberg.com. KD, thank you for joining us at Behind the Story. Thank you for having me. It's quite a privilege. Now, for those who aren't familiar with you and your writing, can you tell us a little bit about you and, and what you're writing? Uh, well, I think like Lisa just said, I. Um, a retired flight attendant and um, raised five kids. And when that sweet season of my life began to end, I knew I needed a purpose and I wanted a kingdom purpose. And God already knew what I was going to be doing next. And he truly had those that next step planned out for me. And um, you know, that's pretty much my story. And he sent, you know, I ended up getting involved in, in writing and particularly um, in, in the biblical fiction area is my main interest. Awesome. Well, your debut, uh, The Egyptian Princess, a story of Hagar, is quite interesting, actually. So I've, I've um, been reading it and I just like how you've done a different point of view. You've used Hagar uh, I guess you fictionalize her being a princess and we want to get to how how you got there with that um, before you're actually doing her second story as a slave so we've got her seeing from um, telling the story a bit like Abraham and Sarah you know how Abraham sort of pretends that Sarah is a um, sister and Pharaoh takes her in nearly um, to be his wife <laughs> very close call oh, yeah. there so yeah it's really interesting and how you've introduce Hagar early um, in this way. So just tell us a bit um, what sparked the story. And, and I, I see you have some author notes at the back of your book explaining it. So do you want to just mm -hmm. share a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had first discovered Hagar during a Bible study and we were, we were learning about the theophanies in the Old Testament. And those are the physical manifestations of God um, when he actually met with people. And um, one night we were on Genesis 16 and the name Hagar came up and the fact that God met with this young, um, handmaid twice. And I realized I didn't know anything about her. So I'm, I'm a researcher by trade. I mean, that's what I love to do mostly. And I started just digging, you know, into, into her life. And I discovered that, um, the Hebrew and Arab traditions of, Hagar is that she was the daughter of the Pharaoh whose harem Sarah went into in Genesis 14 when he claimed that she was just his sister and um, she went into this harem and I believe that's where they possibly met um, so that you know my next my next step was just figuring out what that looked like you know what that world looked like as far as um, being a princess growing up in ancient Egypt. 
And I discovered, you know, they were, the royal sons and daughters were educated um, equally. I mean, they learned how to read and write. They learned politics, mathematics, even medicine. And um, in doing that, it just flipped how I thought of Hagar, even in, in Genesis 16, um, thinking about her not as a lowly slave, but as a very well-educated and cultured young woman. And that's kind of, that became the seed of my story, you know, that just that and the idea of, well, how did this princess end up being becoming a handmaid? You know, what happened? <laughs> And that just intrigued me. And that's where um, my story came from. Wonderful. And I know this is probably, I know you've broken it up in a couple of three um, stories about Hagar. So this is probably in book two, I imagine. But um, a reader asked, um, Bonnie wants to know how Hagar would have felt going back to Abraham after after meeting with God, uh, are you are you able to tell us about that now, or do we have to wait for another interview? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is in the second book. The first book is just takes place in ancient Egypt. You know, I just built that world where a um, a, a royal daughter would have grown up in, um, and I placed Hagar and Sarah in that world. And but the second one, they do go into um, the tribe of Abraham. And um, Bonnie's question is a really good question because I really struggled with that part and why. So what happens here briefly is um, she, Hagar becomes Sarah's handmaid. Um, Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham as a wife so they can have children through her. And then, you know, I kind of write it as the princess rises again in Hagar when she becomes pregnant and she believes she's above Sarah now. Sarah doesn't like that, goes back to ha Abraham and complains. And Abraham actually gives Hagar back to Sarah. So she's kind of been passing around, you know, back and forth in this ultimately is a love triangle between the three of them. And Sarah becomes abusive and sends Hagar, you know, out, you know, at, uh, well, she becomes abusive to the point Hagar flees and tries to go back to Egypt. Um, and I always wondered about that because she did meet with God at that time and God sent her back into this abusive, you know, relationship. And I did struggle with that. It's like, what was that all about? And basically, I think for that time period, if she had continued on her own, it was likely she would have died and the baby would have died. And he was sending her back into um, the tribe to have this child and, and to have it in safety. Yeah, that's it. It's definitely getting into the culture uh, helps you understand right. the decisions Absolutely. that were made. And there's a lot of it is like, what? We wouldn't do that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and we're so thankful <laughs> we're born in this time as women, you know. But, uh, yes, yeah, putting context and how, you know, their faith still works in that in that environment and that culture. So that's excellent. Right. Okay, just a little bit more about you. So you are from South Carolina. Did Have you always lived there? And what's your favourite country? Um, no, I, I grew up in California. I am still to this day a California girl. As they say, I always know what time it is in the West, you know, it's no matter where I am. Um, and that's where my heart is, really. But my family actually were very Southern. They're from Alabama, Tennessee, and South Carolina. And after my husband retired, we ended up settling back here, down here in South Carolina. We're um, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in a golf community here. It's just, it's lovely. And um, we just really enjoyed it. You know, just, we get a little bit of all four seasons but nothing overwhelming. We had come from the Chicago area after 20 years up there. And being a California girl, that weather was a little tough on me, so. <laughs> is that, what is your favorite country out of all the places that you've oh, seen as a flight attendant? Yeah, that, you know, it's that's a tough question because we have, since, you know, I have had the opportunity to travel all over the world. We actually lived in Hong Kong for four years. 
Um, so we saw all of Asia, you know, at that time. And there's so many exotic, wonderful places in Asia, um, India, and Thailand, and Hong Kong, of course, is just fascinating. But overall, my favorite country has to be England. I've always been an Angliophile since I was a, a little kid. I mean, it was always old British authors that I was reading in you know, Austin and McDonald and Dickens and all those guys. I mean, I've read everything they've ever written many times over in my life. Um, and I love visiting England. I mean, the literary um, scene that goes on over there, it's just, it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, you go to Dickens house, you can do these literary tours, you know, and just see just amazing things from these people. But they actually have the, the um, British Library, which houses all of their um, old documents, such as the Magna Carta. Um, they have original writings from Queen Elizabeth I, from Dickens, from um, Beethoven, from Austin. I mean, they're actual manuscripts. You can go in there and read them. And I mean, they have everything from, you know, way back then to all the way up to the Beatles. And you see where, you know, where Lennon had written, scribbled some of his notes for some of his most famous songs on napkins and in restaurants and all of that. So, you know, I always visit there and I always see something unique and um, just fascinating to me, mostly, you know, with the old Oh, like Lewis Carroll, you know, writing um, his book is all there. I mean, it's all written there. Jane Austen's desk is there. And I just, I don't know, I have always loved kind of immersing myself somewhat into their world. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Egypt or to the Middle East? I, yes, we have. I did spend time researching this um, book. Uh, we did go to Egypt. We went over to the Holy Land. Um, you know, we went through the Sinai Peninsula and all of that just to, wow. you know, just, it, it was an amazing trip. Just being able to visit some of the ruins where a lot of these things happened and, you know, and, and finding artifacts or going into the um, Egyptian museum where, um, you know, just everything is housed. Egypt, you know, is, we're constantly learning things about Egypt. And, and it makes it difficult to really write about ancient Egypt because the king's lists are very incomplete and um, we're making new discoveries every day. There's been one in the last year, a major, you know, discovery made and that'll shed more light on what really happened back then. But um, so you kind of had to, I kind of had to just dig and put together what I could um, as far as what a life during the dynastic period of Egypt would have looked like. But it was fascinating. I loved, I mean, I loved Egypt. And, and of course, going to the Holy Land was unbelievable. I, I hope to be able to do it again and spend a little more time there. Have you been over there, Naomi, writing biblical? No, text? no, only in I have been to Hong Kong um, oh. and throughout <laughs> Asia, but not to the not to uh, Bible land. So yeah, that, that yeah. Sounds, I love traveling though. That sounds like it'd be great. So yeah, I put it I put it on the top of your bucket list for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what are your what other hobbies do you have besides obsessing over England and <laughs> making me drool with all your travel and <laughs> um, well basically we do we do like to travel I mean this you know with COVID and all this is last year it's the longest in my adult life I've ever been grounded <laughs> and it's just been it's yeah it's been tough you know not to get out there but I was very productive I mean I wrote two novels this last year so <laughs> in that sense it kept me in my chair and writing but um you know i'm ready to get on the road again and get out there and see what's going on but um so we do like to travel and we also like to golf which has kind of gone by the wayside for me my husband's 
um, handicap has come way down since we've lived here because he's been able to play a lot. But, uh, you know, I've just focused on the writing aspect and golf has kind of gone to the side um, for now. But but I enjoy golf because it's something it's like writing and that you it keeps you present. You have to be in the present moment when you're golfing, because the minute your mind drifts, your game drifts. So you have to be right on it. And I find the same thing is true when I'm writing. I have to be in the moment. I have to be present. And the minute I start drifting away, you know, I've drifted away from my work. Um, so I do like, you know, golf to me is kind of an exercise in, in just being present. Mm. That's interesting. <laughs> My dad's a big golfer and gets up very early in the morning to, <laughs> to get out there. Um, well, now, send him over. We've got seven courses he'd love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, what uh, is your favourite process of the, the writing? You know, is it uh, plotting it out or the research, the actual writing itself, editing? What's your favourite part? My very favorite part is writing the end. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> and, and you've accomplished, you know, you know, you, you, you have a full manuscript and to just be able to put, you know, even in its roughest form, when you write the end, I mean, there's just nothing else like that. Oh, yes. It's That's just right. that sense of accomplishment. I mean, because it is an accomplishment. So many sure. people start novels, but very few people finish novels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be able to flush it out and to stick with it and, and to be able to write those words to me is a major accomplishment. But I also love the research part because I really could just research my whole life and not even write a word, but because I just like to learn, you know, about different things. I've kind of been a lifelong student in that and just, you know, I love it. I'm always off on some bunny trail about something, so... Uh, but finishing, you know, you know what it's like to finish a manuscript and just say, wow, I did it. You know, <laughs> I'm one of the one percent that actually can finish a novel. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Along those lines, you've also not only finished novels, but you've gotten several awards for that. The congratulations. That's a wonderful accomplishment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you like your readers to come away with after reading your books? I always think, I, you know, I'd like them to walk away and say, wow, I didn't know that. And I want to know more about that. You know, that was that was interesting. I learned something, you know, and that's, you know, when you're researching and you're doing things. Of course, my books are fictional, um, but the basic truths, biblical truths are in there. And um, for any, anyone that wants to go on, you know, I love it. I just heard um, this girl wrote me and said, she's so anxious to read the second book. And she said, I kind of cheated and went and read Genesis 16 to see what was going to happen next to Hagar. <laughs> I was like, that's okay. You know, it's okay to go read your Bible. I'm all for that. So it's not um, a spoiler if it's in the Bible, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> But it's, yeah, you know, I just, I like it when people find, yeah, that is, yeah, it was interesting and I want to know more. You know, I think it's the biggest thing. Definitely. I mean, Nomi likes it when pe it brings people to the Bible. They want to check it out. They I understand it's fiction. Right. You know, how did you come up with that? And then what was actually the parts in the Bible? Because it, you know, often there's stories which are just quite to the point. As a matter of fact, this happened, this happened sort of thing. Uh, right. But yeah, I did like you know, um, obviously we know what sort of happens in the, in the story, but, you know, seeing um, Abram and Sarah, like, you know, when she comes out and, like, she's really annoyed with him. Like, she's been really lovely to the girls and everything, but in the palace, but then she, she sees her husband, like, you did this to me. <laughs> she's really angry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it just puts some, you know, real emotion right. to it and puts in context. Yeah, that's she would have been <laughs> not happy to be right. presented as a sister and uh, now she's got to, you know, be with this man and um, and she's just in this, trapped in this different culture, you know, not with her own people. So it would have been a struggle for sure. Um, 
So are you actually a part of a critique group? Do you have people uh, that you're in biblical fiction that you, you rub the, you, these ideas and what about this? I'm thinking of putting this spin on it or how do you work with yeah. big partners? Well, I'm, um, I have an online group through Word Weavers International, which Eva Marie Everson started some years ago. And I have a very unique group in that we've become very close. I mean, we're like each other's posse in writing. And, you know, we're all going to meet up at um, the Blue Ridge Mountain um, Christian Writers Conference coming up the end of May. And, you know, we meet once a month. And, you know, I just trust these girls. I trust them with my writing. I trust them. Four out of the six of us are published authors. Um, and, gosh, they're just, you know, even in Word Weavers, some of the people that have sat in just to see how we were doing things, and they've said they, they don't have another group as, as tight as we are. And, yeah, it's been wonderful, you know, to have these women come alongside you and encourage you and you know we toss around ideas of you know where to where to go to be published or this or that so um yeah I feel really fortunate and I highly recommend word weavers for one if not word weavers then getting into a critique group of people that you trust and and enjoy being around you know I think that's one of the perks in writing is to be able to share it with other you know with other writers yeah, I find the Christian writing community is so supportive. Everyone wants everyone else to succeed. Um, our critique group has been a godsend. Um, there's five and a half of us and we're really close. Um, and none of us, well, so, I mean, everyone reads widely. Um, Lisa, Tabitha and Sarah do primarily romance or women's fiction. Donna does like she's just finished a civil war novel and then I do biblical fiction so it's really awesome because it doesn't even have to be the same genre the same focus or anything like that you know just have the appreciation and and have each other's back like you were saying it's 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 been so helpful for me for sure right and the craft you know it it, it there are rules to the craft yes writing as you as you get into it and, it and it goes across every genre and you know we were critiquing last week on a new piece of mine and some of the girls just brought up hey you forgot this rule you know it's like that constant reminder of um you know just whoopsie you know get back into the you know you know how to do this you know you know how to do it properly and you know they're just really everyone's just kind and supportive like that you know they do it very gracefully and no one's mean so <laughs> but is there anything specific that you edited out of the Egyptian princess there was a lot of what I edited out I you know going into it and building that world you know just when you're in that world building process um you come up with so much stuff and there were so many um interesting facts about Egypt that I wanted to write in and you know you just can't after a while you realize you know they've got to go they're slowing down your story because then you get into just the teaching mode about ancient Egypt and you've gone away from um the story so anything that's slowing down the story you know had to come out but there were a lot of things you know the ancient Egyptians were able to they had a yearly inundation, the yearly flood of the Nile. Um, and they could measure that and know whether it was going to be feast or famine for the next year. Um, and things like that, that I just found so incredibly fascinating, but it really didn't have any place in my book to put it. <laughs> so I had a lot of those kinds of things, just facts, you know, interesting facts. And you know, they always say you have to cut your darlings and those are my darlings, you know, the things that I could teach. And that would, it would be good in a nonfiction book probably, but um, yeah, just a lot of that stuff had to go. You've got The Egyptian Princess. That's been out since March and you're working on your second, uh, second the continuation. Is that what you're actually doing now? Do you want to tell us about your work in progress? Um, 
That that one is actually at the editors right now. And it's going through a content edit with Karen Ball. It's called More Than a Handmaid. And that takes us takes Hagar into um, the first Hebrew tribe. And it's not just about um, her time with the tribe, but it goes on to show, you know, she eventually is totally rejected from the tribe with her son, Ishmael. And but she finds a way to not only survive in the desert. Normally that's a death sentence back in, in those days. You're rejected from the tribe. It's likely you're going to die. Um, but she didn't. She ended up not only surviving, but thriving. And she built, she built a, you know, a, just a tribe of her own actually. And, um, I, and that made sense to me of her being a woman that could actually read and write in that time period, you know, this whole, uh, you know, it's the ultimate man's world, but she kind of had a leg up on all of that being educated in ancient Egypt. So I think that would have helped her make, you know, some decisions and learn how to trade and be a merchant and do whatever she had to do to survive. Wonderful. Well, we'll def definitely look forward to seeing that when it comes out. Um, quickly, what is your website and how can viewers get a hold of you? Um, I'm at wwkdholmberg, H-O-L-M-B-E-R-G, um, at dot com. So that's my website and I can, you know, you can get a lot of information where to find me other places there. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on our show. Well, thank you for having me. It really, yeah, it was a pleasure. It's nice to meet you girls. Awesome. Well, we'll have the your website in the show links. Uh, Naomi and I also give away a Navili when you sign up to our newsletter. I have Act One of Polarized Love and Naomi. Yeah. And I have On Desolate Heights, which is Balaam's story. Um, and uh, KD is also offering to do a giveaway of the Egyptian princess, a story of Hagar. Uh, there is a chance to win, not one, but there are two chances to win this book. So be sure to enter into our giveaway link in the show notes below. Excellent. So we'll have that link for you guys to enter into that. And that's all this time. Until next time, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God bless. See you next time. Amen. So thank you again for joining us today on Behind the Story with Naomi and Lisa. Don't forget to click on the links and subscribe to our YouTube channels and you'll keep up to date with our author interviews. Have a great week. God bless.